come here and give your attention to the report of Scott City. God save the United States and this honorable court. Justice Young presiding. Please be seated. We'll hear arguments today in case number 2023-2024, the state of Olympus versus Mindy Vo. Council for petitioner. Good afternoon, your honors. My name is Kit Byer, and I represent the petitioner, the state of Olympus, on the first issue. Good afternoon, your honors. My name is Danny Byer, and I represent the petitioner, the state of Olympus, on the second issue. Council for respondents. Good afternoon, your honor. My name is Ainsley Stellman, and I represent the respondent, Ms. Mindy Vo, on the due process issue. And good afternoon, your honors. My name is Jason Chayati, and I represent the respondent, Ms. Mindy Vo, on the free exercise clause. Very good. Council petitioners, you have reserved time for a rebuttal. Justice, we'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Very good. The court is prepared to hear argument for the petitioners. Chief Justice, may I proceed? Please. Honorable Chief Justice, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. My name is Kit Byer, and I, along with my co-counsel, Andy Byer, advocate on behalf of Petitioner, the State of Olympus. I will address the right to privacy issue, and my co-counsel will address the free exercise issue. Before I begin, would your honors like a brief recitation of the facts? A very brief one. The State of Olympus leads the nation in rates of sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, in response, Olympus lawmakers passed the Reap What You Sow Act, henceforth the ELISA, which limits the use and distribution of most methods of temporary birth control, except for condoms, the only method effective at preventing STIs. Mindy Vo, whose faith instructs her to use and help others use birth control, obtained contraceptive pills out of state. Back in Olympus, she live streamed herself taking and selling the pills. She was convicted under the ELISA, an appeals court overturned her convictions. Olympus now appeals. This case is about who decides. For the 330 million Americans coast to coast, an essential question of life and health. Your honors, the constitution reserves this power to the people. This court should find in favor of the state and uphold the ELISA for three reasons. First, Griswold versus Connecticut and Eisenstadt versus Baird should be revisited. Second, under Washington versus Glucksburg, the Constitution leaves contraception for the people to decide. And third, even if there is a contraceptive right, the ELISA passes strict scrutiny review. Beginning with my first point, this court should overturn Griswold and its extension Eisenstadt based on the stare decisis factors of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And so can I ask a question about that? So in the Dobbs decision, we had the opportunity to do that and we chose not to. So why would we at this point essentially overturn precedent when we, I guess, implicitly determined in Dobbs that that was not uh, one necessary or even appropriate? Because your honor, although contraception was not at issue in the facts of the Dobbs case, the Dobbs majority stated that each precedent is subject to its own stare decisis analysis and emphasized that the court has, quote, no authority to decree that an erroneous precedent is permanently exempt from evaluation under traditional stare decisis principles, close quote. I don't know that I agree with you that it's inconsistent with principles of stare decisis in this case. One key issue that we had with Dobbs was a question of abortion, which had not been recognized at the time of the Constitution's establishment. But the record makes very clear here that forms of birth control were in existence and were regularly used during that time period. That seems to present a different uh, scenario than what we had when we talked about the historic nature of our analysis in Dobbs. Two points on that, Your Honor. First, as to history, according to page four of the record, the absence of regulation of birth control at the time of the founding did not reflect an affirmative right to practice birth control. Indeed, most abortion laws date to around the 1840s or beyond that point, according to the appendix in Dobbs. And second, the problem with Griswold is that it disavowed any analysis of history altogether, instead relying on a vague and subjective theory of penumbras, that the penumbras of the Bill of Rights protect an unenumerated privacy right, including a contraceptive right, 
also not mentioned. This was inconsistent with precedent before Griswold, such as Snyder versus Massachusetts and Palco versus Connecticut, as cited in Moss. Let me ask you this. Does it matter how many state laws are inconsistent with the asserted right? So many counts suggest Roe versus Wade had validated 40-something state laws, Griswold versus Connecticut, the counts often two or three. Uh, does that have any relevance to the analysis? Your Honor, that does have some relevance to the analysis, although the court should assess history broadly. But as per page four, even when Griswold was decided, the majority of states still had restrictions on birth control. Thus, in establishing the contraceptive right, Griswold demonstrated inconsistency, even with contemporary legal practice. With respect to another stare decisis factor, workability, according to Deanda versus Becerra, the lower courts have split over the conflict between Griswold's contraceptive right and the parental rights this court has affirmed in cases like Meyer versus Nebraska, as cited in Deanda. Griswold thus clashes with prior case law without providing a workable test to resolve conflicts. The last sorry decisive factor is reliance interests. These would involve advanced planning, but according to Dobbs, reliance interests do not extend to cover reproductive planning, given that this involves making broad, generalized assertions about the national psyche. As Justice Black pointed out, dissenting in Griswold, this court has no machinery with which to take a Gallup poll. Hence, Dobbs restricts the reliance inquiry to its traditional sphere of concrete interests, such as property and contracts, which lie within the capacity of courts to assess. Do you think that Washington versus Glucksburg announces the proper test for us to determine whether something is a fundamental right? Yes, Your Honor, it does. Bringing me to my next point, that under the analysis of Glucksburg, the contraceptive right is not protected by the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. According to Glucksburg, the 14th Amendment only protects carefully described fundamental rights, which are objectively deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. Under this rule, we carefully describe the interest here as a right to use and distribute contraception. And based on history, this should be decided by the people. According to page four, state regulations of birth control date back to the 1840s. What would your test be that you would propose then for how we uh, assess privacy rights going forward? We obviously have to write an opinion on this. Um, I understand you're saying that the issue we're dealing with here is at least big enough to readdress questions with regard to contraception. But we don't throw out privacy altogether. Is that what you're proposing or, or what test would you propose? Your Honor, we would propose that this court looks at each specific privacy right and analyzes it on its own merits. As per Reno versus Flores, as cited in Glucksburg, fundamental rights must be carefully described. What would those include? History or tradition or, or what else? Yes, Your Honor, this court, after carefully describing the right, should assess history and tradition to determine if the protected right is deeply historically rooted or not. This is a test asserted in Dobbs as well as Glucksburg, and it is the appropriate standard for analyzing substantive due process claims. As the court pointed out in Glucksburg, this tends to rein in the subjective elements necessarily present in due process judicial review. But looking to history here, there is a long and consistent history of states regulating birth control, all the way until Griswold was decided. And at the time of the ratification of the 14th Amendment, which as per Dobbs is the most important moment in the Glucksburg historical test, most states had restrictions. Would it matter to you if we were to conclude that in the states that regulated birth control, most people ignored the regulations? No, Your Honor, because even so, the states had laws on the books demonstrating that the people did not believe that states lacked the authority to regulate this practice. And thus, because contraception has long been subject to rational regulation, it should be subject only to rational basis review today. If even if the court does apply strict scrutiny, bringing me to my final point, the ELISA can pass this test. It is the least restrictive means of furthering a compelling state interest. Well, Counselor, let me ask you this. So what is the careful description here? Is it the right to use birth control? Because if it's that right, then there are regulations. But what if we had a more specific thought about the core to use certain kinds of birth control? So I'm really asking about the level of specificity at which the careful description of the right occurs. Maybe your description is too abstract. Maybe we should be asking whether temporary methods of birth control, non-condom methods of birth control, are those heavily regulated? Are those sufficiently restricted in enough jurisdictions for enough period of time that there isn't a right? Your Honor, we follow Dobbs, which described a right to abortion, and thus a right to contraception is consistent with this level of abstraction not delving into the particular methods, but specifying the exact conduct at issue. However, should this court find a right to contraception, the ELISA does pass strict scrutiny. As for page six, STIs can cause chronic pain, infertility, and even death. 
And as for page seven, the state has already tried. I Educational. Ask a follow-up question to the inquiry regarding uh, states where these laws are on the books and they're not followed. So how do you synthesize that with the strict scrutiny test that requires the least restrictive means to meet a state goal? But if it's not being followed, how is it at all uh, furthering the goal of the government? Mr. Chief Justice, I see that my time is about to expire. Please okay. answer. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, it does matter for the strict scrutiny analysis whether the law will be effective, but in this case, the law also will be effective because it regulates the contraceptive market in order to promote the use of condoms, which, as for page five, are the only method effective at preventing STIs. And the failure of the state's earlier attempts, including education, free testing, and subsidized medical costs, as per page seven, demonstrate that this comprehensive legislation is necessary to address this crisis. Thus, the law passes strict scrutiny for the foregoing reasons, we respectfully ask this court to reverse the decision of the lower court. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We'll hear from your colleague. Chief Justice, may I proceed? Please. Honorable Chief Justice, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. My name is Andy Beyer, and I will continue to advocate on behalf of Petitioner, the State of Olympus, by addressing the free exercise issue. Your Honors, when an urgent public health crisis calls out for action, a state cannot be left powerless to protect its citizens against conduct that threatens the common good, even when religiously motivated. The issue before the court is whether Olympus's Reap What You Sow Act violates the free exercise clause of the First Amendment as applied to the respondent. And to that question, whether Employment Division versus Smith should be revisited. This court should find in favor of the state for three reasons. First, Employment Division versus Smith is and should remain good law. Second, under Smith, the Reap What You Sow Act, and forth the ELISA, is a neutral law of general applicability that does not violate the Free Exercise Clause. Third, even if Smith were overturned, the ELISA could withstand strict scrutiny review. To begin with my first point, it is unnecessary to revisit Smith pursuant to the stare decisis factors of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. One factor is the quality of the reasoning, considering consistency with precedent. But Smith addressed precedent from as far back as Reynolds versus United States in 1879, rejecting a religious claim for an exemption from a general prohibition on polygamy and recognizing that in a government of laws, Religious disagreement cannot supersede the ability of the legislature to maintain peace and order. The strict scrutiny test outlined in Sherbert versus Verner nearly a century after Reynolds has never independently been used to invalidate a neutral law of general applicability. While Wisconsin versus Yoder did strike down a neutral general law as applied to the Amish, that case involved the combination of the free exercise right the right of parents to control the upbringing of their children. Let me push back on your argument a little bit. I don't know that I agree with you that the reasoning, the rationale supporting Smith is necessarily invalid. One thing we certainly have with the, with the Smith line of cases is that it announces a body of law that um, is clear and can create expectations so that we don't have everybody running to court every day claiming their own uh, religious purpose and an example. That certainly seems to be an important policy reason for no other thing if, if, that Smith covers that, that your argument doesn't appear to be addressing. Your Honor, we do contend that policy measures such as that which Your Honor proposes do support retaining the Smith standard. Because if Smith were overturned, judges would be returned to exactly the position that this court has rejected in cases like Dobbs and Washington versus Glucksburg. One could conceive of a physician who felt compelled by her religion to help a patient commit assisted suicide via euthanasia, or to undergo an abortion in states where this conduct is illegal. This case demonstrates that these concerns are not merely hypothetical. The court in Dobbs recognized that the judiciary has neither the authority nor the expertise to adjudicate disputes involving such profound moral and scientific questions and to weigh the relative importance of the competing interests involved. And this difficulty would not diminish if a free exercise claim were to be substituted for a substantive due well, the process. The judiciary does have the ability to determine whether or not exceptions are being denied to those who are seeking to practice their faith, even if exceptions are granted to others. 
Isn't that what we decided in Fulton? Yes, Your Honor, but the exemptions included in the LISA identified on page two of the record are distinct from the systems of individualized exemptions that the court has rejected in cases like Fulton, in which a government official had open-ended discretion to decide- well, here we have a situation where those for whom it is medically necessary are exempt. Is that not right? Yes, Your Honor. But those for whom it's religiously necessary are not exempt. That is correct. So we're prioritizing medical necessity over religious faith. Where's the, where's the medical exercise clause of the constitution that would allow you to prioritize that over free exercise? Your Honor, this court's precedent in Tandon versus Newsom recognized that when the state allows exemptions that are pursuant to its interest, then it may constitutionally deny a religious exemption. In this case, the medical exemption that the state allows is made pursuant to its interest, which as per page 10 of the record is in promoting public health. There is no such specific health benefit to granting a religious exemption to members of the church of balance. And therefore, under the Tandon standard, this is not comparable conduct, particularly given that Mindy Vo seeks not only to use birth control herself, but to distribute it widely and indiscriminately to others. As per page three of the record, she procured a substantial quantity of birth control from an out-of-state pharmacy wholesaler and distributed it to those who were not exempt from the ELISA. To grant her and other Church of Balance members a religious exemption would be to write the law out of existence. If she believed that her eternal soul was at stake, and you have not challenged, I think, the sincerity of her religious conviction, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. If she genuinely believed that her eternal soul were at stake because of this, is that not something that the state would regard as of comparable value to someone who would have a medical problem but for receiving contraception? Your Honor, it is not that this interest is less valuable, but rather that in the context of the STI crisis with which Olympus is faced, it can only brook departures in the case of these health specific exemptions that benefit the state's goals, as per page 10 of the record, in promoting the health of men and women alike. But that's not the only government interest that um, is being asserted. It's not just a health issue, it's also morality. And so if you're legislating morality, doesn't that just fall in the face of suggesting that it does not contradict someone else's religious belief? Because someone's religious belief might be defined by a different interpretation of morality. And so isn't that prohibiting them then from their constitutional right to their own exercise of religion? No, Your Honor, because as the court has recognized in Smith and reaffirmed in cases like Church of Lakumi versus Hialeah, religious disagreement alone does not mean that a law is subject to strict scrutiny review. This would defeat the very purpose of the Smith test itself, which was to ensure that the government can enforce neutral general laws, even in the face of religious disagreement. And under Lakumi, a law does not become invalid simply because it may happen to promote or reflect a morality that coincides with that of certain religions. Indeed, all laws may promote a certain morality to some extent. Rather, what Lakumi requires is that the law was targeted toward religious conduct. That is not the case here. Olympus was not seeking to suppress the religious use of birth control, but to safeguard the health of its citizens. Thus, the law passes the Smith test. But even if the court were to find that Smith should be overturned or that it does not hear control, Olympus would still prevail because the rights of passes even strict scrutiny review. Under Marshall versus United States, as cited in Dobbs, courts defer to the legislature in areas fraught with medical and scientific uncertainties. Here, Olympus has a compelling interest, since as per page seven of the record, over 200 of the state's citizens are dying of STI-related deaths each year, and there are over 600,000 new cases. The state's clinics are overwhelmed, putting people's health and their lives at risk. Moving to the narrowly tailored component of the test, this law is not overbroad as applied to Mindy Vo and Church of Balance members. In Schroeder versus Werner, citing Braunfeld versus Brown, the court recognized that religious exemptions are not required, even under strict scrutiny, when to grant one would be to render a statutory scheme unworkable. That would be precisely the effect of exempting Miniveau in the case at bar, since Miniveau seeks to distribute birth control as part of her religious faith, as per page three of the record. If she were granted the exemption that she seeks, individuals could simply obtain non-condom birth control from Ms. Vo's pharmacy or the pharmacies of other church of balance members. What specifically is the morality that is being promoted by this? 
Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I see that my time is close to expiring. May I request a brief extension to answer? You may answer. Your Honor, the state seeks to encourage sexual responsibility to ensure that individuals are aware that they must protect themselves and others from the severe consequences of STIs, which could include such things as infertility, chronic pain, and even death. Well, I have one follow-up, and you may answer it as well. The state of Olympus allows abortion still. Is it not strange to allow that, but then claim that this advanced promotion of morality is essential uh, is to require the forbidding of contraception? Please answer that question, and then we'll switch to the other side. Yes, Your Honor. No, Your Honor, since the state here is focused on the pressing concerns of the STI epidemic, and thus the morality on which it is focused is ensuring that its citizens are taking responsibility to protect themselves and others from the serious health consequences of these diseases, which are afflicting over a third of the population, as per page seven of the record. If, thank you, counsel. Thank you, your honors. We will hear from counsel for the respondents. Yes, your honor. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Ainsley Stellman, and I, along with my co-counsel, Mr. Jason Chiotti, represent the respondent, Ms. Mindy Vo. I'll be addressing the violation to Ms. Vo's right to privacy. Nearly 60 years ago, in Griswold versus Connecticut, this court reasoned that if the sacred protections of the Constitution are to mean anything, Elias also recognized certain realms of privacy around those rights, which also warrant protection. Today, the state of Olympus is encroaching on one of those zones of privacy by decriminalizing decisions regarding contraception. We ask this court thus to reaffirm that the Constitution protects a right to privacy that includes the right to make choices regarding contraception. Well, they're not, the state is not criminalizing every aspect of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, right of uh, the birth control right. You, you say they're criminalizing it, but they're not criminalizing every aspect of it, are they? That's true, Your Honor. The state still allows for condoms, but the state is criminalizing choices concerning contraception, which is a fundamental zone of privacy, infringing on that fundamental zone, which subjects them to strict scrutiny. We ask this court to reaffirm the judgment of the lower court for three reasons. Let me, let me more just limit, can we go back to the question I had? Uh, the the dissent um, in in the state court of uh, supreme court uh, notes that uh, the majority's recounting of the history of birth control demonstrates that at times birth control use has been permitted and at other times not. This and it says this hardly constitutes being deeply rooted in our nation's history and tradition. So do you, are you going to address that statement in your argument? Yes, Your Honor. That is under the Glucksburg framework that petitioner is urging this court to use. However, Washington versus Glucksburg is specific to areas of law that have not yet been decided. Griswold, and then subsequently in Washington versus Glucksburg, Lawrence versus Texas, and Obergefell versus Hodges all establish clearly defined five zones of familial privacy. Those five zones have been workable and what this court has been relying on since Griswold's decision over around 60 years ago. But in some of those other cases, such as Lawrence that you note, there was a, uh, a recognition of a fundamental right and it was, the, it was liberty actually that the court addresses. And here, um, the, the cornerstone of the argument is essentially that there is a constitutional right to privacy. How, how does that work after our decision in Dobbs when it's somewhat challenged whether or not that's actually found in the Constitution? Dobbs does not control this court's decision today because Dobbs concerned abortion, which is not within those five fundamental zones of familial privacy. Those five zones are first, choices concerning contraception, procreation, marriage, family relations, and and child rearing. And where do you find that in, con in the text of the Constitution? Those are from, they're not in the text of the Constitution, Your Honor. The Constitution in its 14th Amendment says that individuals may not be denied life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. Now, the question of what liberty means has been established by this court since Griswold. 
In fact, Lawrence versus Texas even says that the most pertinent beginning point of the substantive reach of liberty under the due process clause is this court's decision in Griswold versus but Connecticut. Counselor, I think one of the concerns we have on the bench is do we need a coherent approach rather than a patchwork where some decisions are under a broader standard, maybe waived in under substantive due process and other cases take a narrow approach under Glucksburg? Should we have a coherent approach? And should that coherent approach be Glucksburg would be my question. Yes, Your Honor. We agree that there should be a coherent approach, but I argue that what the court is currently using is coherent. Currently, the court has five inviolable zones of familial privacy. You mentioned one of those is procreation. Why isn't that something that Dobbs is directly relevant to? Procreation is defined more narrowly than abortion, Your Honor. Abortion has always been considered a separate issue because it concerns a potential life that's already existing, whereas procreation and contraception do not. That's why abortion isn't included in those five zones that this court has been using for the last 60 years. Those five zones give this court an objective metric that's measurable and usable and has been workable. And then when something falls outside of those five zones, then this court uses its Glucksburg analysis, which is appropriate and workable. And that's why we asked this court to uphold the use of Griswold, both because of two stare decisis factors. First, its workability in those five zones and its disruption to other areas of law. Because since Glucksburg, Griswold is the foundation and cornerstone of this court's substantive due process law, all of those familial privacies would have no foundation if this court were to overturn that decision. Would you <clears throat> agree with me that uh, issues relating to privacy, do they evolve with time? Do they, if, if you're arguing here that they expanded in the 60s and 70s that they can contract at some point? or once they expand, are they forever locked into place? It's true, Your Honor, that there could be an evolving view of liberty. We can see from Loving versus Virginia and Obergefell versus Hodges, which cites Loving, in both of those cases, America has had an evolving view of liberty in that we now view interracial marriage to be an inherent liberty and same-sex marriage to be the same. And along those lines, if... Um, American society or the voters in a particular state, for example, decide that their evolving view of privacy is changing, then shouldn't we also uh, follow those rules and, and allow that back to, to contract back to a different state? No, not necessarily, Your Honor. For one, this court has no precedent of recognizing a contracting view of liberty and revoking liberties that were once recognized in that way, especially when they've been codified like they have in these five zones of privacy. This court has recognized choice to be inherent to each of those five zones. Well, Counselor, yeah. a lot of people would describe Dobbs, the move from Roe to Dobbs is exactly what we're, we're talking about here, where we've moved from a broader view of a constitutional right to a narrower view to return power to legislatures, if you could respond to that point. Yes, Your Honor. The issue with Dobbs is that abortion had only been recognized in Roe and Casey, but it had neither been grounded in history and tradition, nor was it anchored in one of those five fundamental zones of privacy. It had always been understood as a distinct thing, not inherent, not inviolable like those five zones. That's why the two issues are different, and that's why contraception is more comparable to the issue of marriage, to the issue of procreation, and to of child rearing. And in each of those three areas, this court has recognized choice to be fundamental. When it comes to child rearing, this court in Troxel versus Granville, as cited in DeAnda versus Becerra, struck down a state statute that would limit parental choice and hospital visitation rights for their children, because this court reasoned that parental choice was fundamental. Similarly, in Pierce versus Society of Sisters, as cited in Justice Souter's concurrence in Washington versus Glucksburg, this court again struck down a state statute that would prohibit parental choice and where their child would go to school, because choice was fundamental. We can look next to the zone of procreation. In Skinner versus Oklahoma, as cited in Justice Souter's concurrence to Glucksburg, this court explicitly said and recognized the fundamental nature of choice when it came to procreation. I, I think my esteemed colleague, going back to his question and all of the examples you're giving, those are uh, rights that have been recognized without question, but here you have a statute that is criminalizing something that has been um, made illegal by state. So there isn't that same history of it always being recognized as a right. So is it actually analogous to these other examples that you're providing here? 
We would argue that it is, Your Honor, especially because some of those zones do have a history of being regulated, like the if zone of marriage. And yet this court recognized that even though interracial marriage used to be illegal, same-sex marriage used to be illegal, still there's an inviolable zone of marriage in that way. And let me, so let me ask this question. We, you know, just a few years ago, we had the nation saw issues dealing with an opioid crisis where there was a medication that was taken orally that, that caused uh, unintended effects to, to a lot of Americans. Uh, may have been intended well in the beginning, but it certainly had bad consequences going forward. Um, I don't think anybody in American society would have said under those circumstances that anybody has a constitutional right to take an, o an opioid. Uh, it, it sounds to me like the state is saying, hey, look here, we're not preventing all forms of birth control. We're only trying to eliminate some forms of birth control that may not be as effective. And, and so I'm trying to understand your constitutional lines uh, and how it how it fits into that. Yes, Your Honor. Chief Justice, I see my time is expiring. May I respond? You may. Your Honor, I'd have two points on that. First, that taking an opioid would not fall into this notion of familial privacy. There's something inherent to the family and to sexual relationships that are different from just individual medical care. So that is the first thing that would distinguish the two. But second, Your Honor, I'd point you to the fact that the state, if there is a fundamental right to that kind of family relationship, would have to pass strict scrutiny, just like they would if they were going to be regulating certain kinds of opioids. And the state fails strict scrutiny in the narrow tailoring prong because it leaves unaddressed certain other causes in the finding of the court under footnote 15. Because of that, we ask this court to affirm. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We'll hear from your colleague. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, your honors, and may it please the court. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Triati, and I represent the respondent, Ms. Mindy Vo, on the First Amendment violation. Incorporated to the states in 1940, the Free Exercise Clause bars the government from enacting laws which prohibit the free exercise of religion. The state of Olympus contravened this constitutional provision when it denied Ms. Vo a religious exemption to the Ribwadiso Act. The Olympus Supreme Court correctly ruled this denial to be unconstitutional. So we ask this court to affirm that judgment for two reasons. First, the state's reliance on Employment Division versus Smith is misguided due to Smith's divergent reasoning on religious liberty and inconsistency with prior free exercise precedent. Do we have to overturn Smith in order to find that there is a violation of a constitutional right uh, regarding this statute? Not necessarily, Your Honor. Our position is that Smith should be overturned because it is discordant with the free exercise jurisprudence that preceded it. But even if this court were to uphold Smith, we contend that the law is not neutral in substance. And so for that reason, the appropriate standard of review is strict scrutiny for this law. That leads me to the second point, that the, that the Rebuilding So Act fails strict scrutiny for it does not have a compelling interest in specifically denying Ms. Bo an exemption. In Church of the Lukumi Babalu IA versus the city of Hialeah, decided just three years after Smith, Justice David Souter concurring in the judgment argued that facial neutrality is not determinative. So in other words, it's not enough for the state to pass a law that looks purportedly neutral, but it must also be neutral in substance. Specifically, Justice Souter noted that when a law creates a disproportionate burden on one religious group over other religious groups, that law would fail neutrality. Wouldn't that be true of any law in which you have a religion that takes the position opposite the law? Well, that would be true, Mr. Chief Justice, and our position is not that the state is never allowed to incidentally infringe on religious freedom, but when they do do so, they must satisfy the strict scrutiny standard. But, but that means we're always going to be using strict scrutiny, if I understand your point, because as long as there is any religious group that says, well, that thing is something that's really important to us, it's going to disproportionately affect us because other religions don't care about this, we're in strict scrutiny for everyone because of one minority view. Is that what you're arguing to us today? Yes, Mr. Chief Justice. Now, we want to be very clear that even under the compelling interest test that preceded Smith, religious claimants still have to show two things. First, they must show that they have a sincere religious belief. And second, that that sincere belief has been substantially burdened by the it, law. Didn't Smith itself have a disparate impact on the Native American church, the law at issue in Smith? 
Well, why then was that considered neutral in that case? Well, Your Honor, it's because when Smith introduced its rule, it talked about merely facial neutrality. And it wasn't until Justice Souter's concurrence in Lukumi where there was thought about whether or not facial neutrality is enough or whether the law must also be substantively neutral in order to pass the Smith test. Justice so, Souter was a great colleague. Has his view ever become the majority opinion? It has not, Your Honor. But that is precisely the problem that Smith has. It allows the government to curtail religion so long as it does so with a law that looks neutral on its face and a law that applies to everyone. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the point that if we adhere to Smith, there is a neutrality requirement. But if any law that has a disparate impact on any religion is non-neutral, then it seems to me that's really overturning Smith, right? Because it would be impossible to find a law that would actually be contested by someone that doesn't have a disparate impact. There were a law against homicide, but if you had a religion that did human sacrifice, then that would be a disparate impact. Yes, Your Honor, our position is that Smith should be overturned because it fundamentally misunderstands the free exercise clause and religious liberty by extension as a second class right that's contingent on the non-discriminatory nature. But if we disagree with you and don't intend to overturn Smith, then we're not going to embrace a definition of neutrality that essentially uh, overrules Smith without that being our choice to do. If that makes sense. So we would, if we adhere to Smith, we're going to need a definition of neutrality where some laws are actually neutral, where that is a, an analytical conceptual possibility that a state legislature could do. Well, Your Honor, it's not a position that if this court adopts a definition of neutrality that is contingent on the disproportionate impact of the law, that this court would have to overturn Smith. Because when Justice Souter made that claim and highlighted that definition of neutrality in his concurrence, he looked at a hypothetical law a national prohibition on alcohol that removed an exemption from sacramental wine. Now that hypothetical, he contended, would fail neutrality because it would disproportionately and negatively impact Christians who take wine in sacramental settings, but would not impact other religions that did not take part in sacramental wine. In this case, the Reba Yusso Act disproportionately burdens Ms. Vo and members of the Church of Balance. In response to Ms. Vo using oral contraceptives, the state fined her $1,000, they arrested her, and most importantly, unconstitutionally labeled her a criminal for abiding by a core tenant of her faith, a faith that the state has stipulated is sincere, per page one of the record. So there is not only a sincere religious belief that Ms. Bo has, but that sincere belief is being substantially burdened by the Reboot So Act. And thus the appropriate standard of review is strict scrutiny to which the state cannot meet that high bar of judicial review. First, the strict scrutiny standard requires the government to show that there is a compelling interest in passing the law. But in the context of the First Amendment, in the words of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in her concurrence in Smith, the First Amendment demands a more precise analysis. And in defining what that more precise analysis is, this court in Gonzalez versus Centro Espirita Beneficente Unialdo Vegetal as cited in Justice Alito's concurrence in Fulton, held that courts must scrutinize the asserted harm in granting a specific religious claimant a religious exemption. So by inverse, the government must show that they have a compelling interest in specifically denying Ms. Bowen exemption, to which they have none. The record on pages two and three tell us several things about Ms. Bow. She's an owner and operator of a pharmacy. She's part of a religion that emphasizes responsibility. She's a married woman, and most importantly, a woman who has endured three troublesome pregnancies, developing preeclampsia and at risk of death with subsequent pregnancies. These factors show us that Ms. Bo is a reasonable and responsible individual seeking to carry out her religious beliefs under the Church of Balance. When we apply this um, religious burden analysis that you're proposing we readopt after jettisoning uh, Smith, What's the scope of, of our review? Is it what one individual sincerely believes? Do we look at what a group of individuals believe and how big is that group? How small is that group? Well, Your Honor, in the context of this case, this court granted Sergio Rory to analyze the free exercise issue as applied to Mindy Vo, the respondent. So it's, it's on a 300 million Americans, for example, we have to analyze that constitutional position of what they sincerely believe on a case-by-case -case basis, on an individualized basis? Yes, Your Honor, because that was the precedent that this court adhered to from Sherbert versus Verner all the way up until Smith. What, what, 
what makes that uh, a workable test? It, it seems like if we're doing that, then uh, the trial courts and the appellate courts, all we're going to be doing is answering religious questions because somebody's always going to have uh, uh, an explanation that, that what the government imposes on them is, a, is an unreasonable burden. That might be true hypothetically, Your Honor. Well, let's say, for example, I want to run up I want to run a prostitution ring out of my church. I, I can now claim that I've got a religious uh, free exercise right to do so, and and we're going to be debating the the criminal laws from a from a religious perspective before we can ever get to the merits of the case. Well, Your Honor, in that hypothetical, that religious belief would not be deemed sincere by this court. But even if wait wait wait, it, why why is that? Are there not various religions throughout world history that actually believed, including in Greek and Roman? times that prostitution could be a sacred thing. Well, Your Honor, if uh, Mr. Associate Justice, if you're referring to a Christian church, for example, it's it's known by, by popular knowledge that the Christian church does not engage in prostitution. There's a lot more religions in the United States today than Christianity. Well, well yes, Your Honor. And our position is that if someone were to assert that belief, the government would prevail on strict scrutiny. Because as this court in Sherbrooke versus Werner acknowledged, there are indeed limits to the free exercise right. Um, but in this case, Ms. Bo is seeking to carry out a religious belief that has been deemed sincere by this court. Well, so so would, would the government prevail on the sincerity ground of the prostitution? What, what, what if I ask you to, to stipulate that it was sincerely held? This was a way of worship. What's the basis for the government prevailing in the prostitution hypothetical then? They would prevail, Your Honor, on the compelling interest point under this analysis. Which is what? Analysis. what? What is it? Well, the, the compelling interest point is that prostitution, as we see in footnote 15 of the record, is one of the factors that have been contributing to the STI crisis. So whether prostitution is occurring here in the state of Olympus or in another, Your Honor, I see that my time has expired. May I briefly answer you, you, you may. And I would ask that you, as you answer that question, explain why, if, if prostitution is contributing to it, the state also believes that non-condom forms of birth control have contributed to it. So if the sincerely held belief in prostitution will fail, why would not the sincerely held belief in other forms of, in forms of non-condom contraception fail for that same reason? Well, Mr. Chief Justice, the Reaper you say act would fail strict scrutiny because it seeks to regulate the use of non-condom birth control for individuals that are religious, but allows individuals with a medical exemption to use those various forms of non-condom birth control that provide no protection against the STI crisis. The medical exemption renders the law not only generally applicable, not generally applicable, but it also strips the law of its ability to carry out the actual reason for passing the Rebuilding So Act, the public health and safety crisis. It's for that reason that this court has labeled Ms. Vo a criminal for abiding by her sincerely held religious beliefs. And we ask this court to affirm, and we thank this court for its time. Thank you, counsel. We're here. Rebuttal. Chief Justice, may I proceed? Please. May it please the court, two points on rebuttal. Addressing the privacy issue. Opposing counsel relies on precedent concerning, for example, parental rights and marriage rights. But to your honor's question, Associate Justice Nolan, this court does need a principled, coherent method of finding rights. And to your honor's question, Associate Justice Breedbub, that method is history and tradition. The marriage and parental rights are deeply historically rooted. The opposing counsel relies, for instance, on Loving and Obergefell. In Obergefell, the court stated that the right to marry is fundamental as a matter of history and tradition, and used the Equal Protection Clause, which Ms. Vail has not invoked, to extend that historically rooted marriage right to a new class of people. However, there is no equal protection claim here, and the record demonstrates that contraception does not have the deep historical roots that, for instance, the right to marry and the parental right have. What if the right is redefined? You're suggesting that it's defined as a right to contraception. What if it's the opposite? It's the right to family planning. Um, isn't that deeply rooted in history that uh, one has a, a right to plan their family, the size of their family in the way that they see fit? Your Honor, as the court made clear in Dobbs, the Constitution does not protect a generalized family planning right. And indeed, contrary to opposing counsel's claims, this court has repudiated rights in the past, and it should do the same today with Griswold and Isistat. 
Now, to address the free exercise issue, opposing counsel suggests that disparate impact alone is enough to render a law non-neutral or generally applicable under Smith. But to your honest question, Associate Justice Nowlin, the law that Smith upheld itself was disproportionately affecting the Native American church. Peyote is not popular as a recreational drug due to its bitter taste. This was a disproportionate impact and it was upheld. Thus, this court should uphold the Rewaisa. And for the foregoing reasons, we ask this court to reverse. Thank you, counsel. The Thank case you. is submitted. All right.